Greetings in that name that is above every name, for the Bible declares that at the name of every knee shall bow and every tongue must confess that he is Lord. How blessed we are, how wonderful it is to be here on another wonderful Lord's Day, and what a difference a day make. God has given us, amen, amen goes there. Amen. God has given us another wonderful day, and we are delighted to be here and to come and to worship the Lord together. And I'm glad that you are here. Amen. Amen. And amen. I am so delighted. I am looking forward. Amen to the worship today and looking forward to a word today. You picked a good day to come to church today. Amen. Amen. You picked a good day and God has given us a good day. You know, uh, somebody asked me uh, uh, some time ago, uh, what do, uh, when are you going to have something special at Second Mount Zion? I said, we have something special at Second Mount Zion every Sunday. Amen. Because if you miss one Sunday, you're gonna miss you're gonna miss something. I don't care which Sunday you pick, you're gonna miss something. And and uh, we honor uh, Women's History Month this month, the month of March. Amen. Amen. We we honor our our women, and uh, amen. We, we're going to bring back. You know, before the pandemic, we had BAM Sunday. Amen. Amen. We're going to bring BAM Sunday back, and and that's that. that that's I didn't I didn't say that. I said B A M. Amen. BAM Sunday, and BAM, BAM means bring a man, and that that is the, that is the Sunday on the fourth Sunday. That's the Sunday where the men outnumber the women. Because, because, I said, it's not men day, but it's the Sunday where the men outnumber, at least we try to anyway. We, tr we try to outnumber the women because there's always, always uh, women. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Deacon Simpson. Deacon Simpson said we can do it. He, 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 he is so encouraging. <laughs> hey, hey, man. He gives, he gives me encouragement because, because we have, watch this now. We have Women Day, Men Day, Children Day, every Sunday. Amen. We, we don't have a special day just for women, but we honor Women's History Month. But, uh, but I, want, I want everybody involved every Sunday. Amen. I want young people involved. Amen. I, I want folk my age involved. And I want, want middle-aged folk involved. Both women and men. Because I think I read somewhere, Wilbert. I think I read somewhere, Deacon Moore, that, that uh, I think I read somewhere where it says that in Christ there is no male, nor female, nor bond, nor free, but everybody is the same in Christ Jesus. And, and, that's, and that's the way we try to do it here at Second Mount Zion. We try to involve everybody every Sunday. Amen? Amen. And so any Sunday that you miss, you're going to miss something. I am so delighted to have all of these persons on board who have joined us today. Amen. Look, amen. Look who's joined us today. Amen. And there are some that I got on kind of late and uh, I made a mistake. The first one I made all day. Amen. And uh, we are delighted to have Sister Keita Blackwell with us today. 
Brother Nafif, all, Key to Blackwell, all the way from Felton, Maryland. Amen, Sister Keith, uh, Brother Kilaf. Kali Nafif, amen. We're delighted to have you on board. And if I pronounce your name wrong, just know that there's more than one way to pronounce your name. Amen. Sister Tiffany, Sister uh, Tammy, amen. Amen, amen, amen. We're, we're delighted to have you on board, Sister Marsha Hand. Sister Alexandra Hayes Walker is on board. Sister Sheila Adams is on board. Delighted to have you on board. Sister Kimberly T. Hand is on board. Sister Barrett Benetta Robinson Dorn is on board. Sister jo Sandra Johnson Mack is on board. Delighted to have you on board. Amen. Sister Pamela Saunders, all the way from Glenside, Pennsylvania, we're delighted to have you on board. Amen. Brother Ronnie K. McNeil is on board. Amen. Delighted to have you on board. Amen. Brother Gerald Young is on board. Sister Susie Roberts is on board all the way from Sylvania, Georgia. Amen. Amen. Got Georgia on my mind, y'all. Amen. Brother Daniel J. Johnson is on board. We're delighted to have him on board. Amen. And we're delighted to have all of those persons on board who are sharing with us today. Amen. And if you're visiting with us today, you know, uh, we're delighted to have all of those persons who are visiting with us. Amen. Welcome to Second Mount Zion. And if you are here today, uh, you're in for a treat because our own uh, Minister Tiffany D. Curtis is going to be bringing the word today. Amen. All right. And, uh, and uh, I'm announcing her now because our service kind of flows. Amen. It, it kind of flows. Amen. Because everybody in here is a worship leader. Amen. I say everybody is a worship leader. You lead your own worship. Amen. When, and and you, they've already been spotlighted, and, uh, and whenever it's your time to do whatever you do, I don't even remember the order of service no more. Because folk just do what they do. Let us stand. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. All right, let us sing now with uplifted voices.
from chapter 4, verse 12 through 17. Esther's response was reported to Mordecai. Mordecai told the messenger to reply to Esther, don't think that you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you are in the king's palace. If you keep silent at this time, liberation and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. But you and your father's house will be destroyed. Who knows, perhaps you have come to your royal position for such, time, for such a time as this. Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, day or night. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. After that, I will go to the king, even if it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went and did everything Esther had ordered him. And may the Lord add a blessing to his word. Hello, everybody. Um, I think I'm here for us to uh, pray. So we're going to put our heads down in prayer. God, thank you for everything that you've given me in my life. Thank you for everything that you've given us in our lives. Thank you for taking care of us through thick and thin. And thank you for never leaving us behind. 
Please help me in the future to get through all my struggles. And please help everybody that needs to get through their struggles right now to get through them. Please help everybody that's tempted by sin to get back on their feet and get through it. And please help everyone who's who's struggling right now, may not have a home, may not have food to eat. Please let them get that today or tomorrow. If if we can do anything to help, please let us know. Please give us a message. If if we can do anything that, that can help others, please give us a message. If we can do anything to get through sin ourselves and help ourselves, please give us a message. Thank you, God, for taking care of us all our lives. Amen.
Amen. There we go. There we go. Thank you, choir, for starting us off. Amen. Getting us started on this wonderful Lord's Day. We welcome you. We welcome you. Before we get to the Sunday school, we just have some brief, brief, brief announcements. As always, we encourage you, if you are sending any mail correspondence, specifically your tithes, we ask that you would send them to Second Mount Zion's P.O. Box, which is Post Office Box 41839, Philadelphia, PA, 19101. We ask for those of you who are in person, if you would refrain from eating or drinking in the sanctuary, if you must, please excuse yourself and go into the lobby, follow directions of our ushers. We also ask that if you or any, man, any member of your family takes ill, that you would call the church and give us a confirmed knowledge so that we can have confirmed knowledge and we continue to pray for those who are on our sick list. Upcoming events, we want to remind you that our Easter trunk hunt is fastly approaching. That is going to be March 30th at 12 p.m. There will be plenty of food and games for everyone. So we ask if you want to support this, that you would support, you can support monetarily. Uh, you can see myself or Sister Kimberly Hand to support. Amen. Or you can put it in your envelope. Also quickly approaching is our 95th church anniversary. 95 years of ministering in this community. They say, yes, you can clap. That goes a clap there. And with this big event, Pastor has set a big, audacious goal for Second Mount Zion. And that goal is that we are looking to raise $95,000. And I know that sounds large and it might be intimidating. Yeah, you can clap, you can clap, because I believe we're going to do it. Amen. And now, now we are opening this up for the whole year, so you have the rest of 2024 to get that in. There's a drop down in the Easy Tides categories for church anniversary, so you can begin to start uh, 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 paying on your church anniversary. Amen. So we ask that you would help us to reach that goal. Amen. And it might sound like a big number, but it's definitely a doable number. Amen. Amen. We 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 gonna we gonna reach that goal. I believe it. Amen. We also want to say Happy Women's History Month. Amen. And we are celebrating that. And in that in that vein, I am going to step aside and let our very own sister Kenesha Moore come forth, and she's going to give us our Sunday school lesson. And she is more than capable. Put your hands together and say Amen for Sister Kenesha. Amen. Good morning, SMZ. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Um, I am excited to be here today. I'm excited to be here on this first Sunday in March. And as Deacon Simpton said, it is Women's History Month. So shout out to all my ladies. <laughs> And I'm so glad to be a part of a church and to have a pastor who sees the value of not just men, but also women in the body of Christ. Um, if we could just go ahead really quick and bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Spirit of the living God, we invite you into this place. We invite you into this Sunday school class. We ask that you would open up the hearts of those who are sitting in the pews. God, I ask that you would use me as your vessel so that my words can come out with power and clarity and seeds might take root in the hearer's heart so that fruit could blossom in your kingdom. And we will be careful to give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so a couple weeks ago, um, I was scrolling through Facebook, and at the top, it said, 11 years ago, see your memories. Um, and as I scrolled through and I was looking through the memories, I took notice of the condition of my body. Um, and I began to think of all the things that I did to prepare for this trip that I was going on. Um, and I'm not claiming that I was any next top model or I was any bodybuilding shape, but I'm gonna tell you, I was looking good. I mean, my stomach was on flat, flat, my, my waist was snatched, my thighs were toned, and you could tell that I had been doing some work. 
Now, some of you might be sitting there looking at me like, what was 11 years ago? So why are you so excited? Well, yes, it was 11 years ago, but this was shortly after I had given birth. And if there's any women in the congregation, you know that that can be a hard trip when you're trying to snatch back. Um, so you could tell that I had been doing some work. You could tell that my diet, you know, I was eating lean meats, low carbs, and I was in the gym. Um, but some months had passed on. Um, and I, I lost that pregnancy weight and then some. Um, and I kept the same diet, but I wasn't as motivated, so I, I stopped going to the gym. And I started slacking off. I been get, began to eat more sweets and fatty cuts of meat. Um, and then eventually time went on and the gym was non-existent. Uh, the diet that I was on was non-existent. So while after just having a baby, I was in the best shape of my adult life, quickly after things began to decline. Um, and it's been a little disappointing, if I'm just being vulnerable, to see how fast I can get out of shape. I mean, the reality is, if you just sit around, your physical condition begins to decline quickly. I mean, I wish I could just get in shape once and that was all it took, no more conditioning, you was there and everything was all right. How many of you wish that would happen? Yeah. Um, but the, the reality is, if you want to remain in shape and if I want some of this fat to go away and I want to improve my condition, then I'm going to have to do some work. Um, now, some of you might not be pr impressed with my little story, but how about Iron Mike Tyson? Um, who was the undisputed champion of the world. Um, he had defended his title nine times, but, I said but, somebody say but. January of 1990, one of the greatest upset in sports history when he fought against Buster Douglas. Now, yes, Mike showed up to this fight 30 pounds overweight. Um, he declined to watch any of the videos of Buster Douglas fight because he had knocked out all of those opponents. And in the ninth round, the 42 to one underdog knocked him out for the first time in his career. What am I saying, what am I saying? I'm saying that it's not a perfect metaphor, but our spiritual conditioning is much like our, our physical conditioning is much like our spiritual conditioning. We got to do some work. And while some of you as spring or is approaching might be fighting to get that summer body back, Jude in this text today is going to teach us how to fight and contend for the faith. Uh, and I'm just going to give this message a title today, and it's going to be simply Fighting for the Faith. The print of the passage for today comes from Jude and verses 17 through 25. Um, and early in the chapter, he's called out false teachers. Um, and finally, he's going to turn his attention back to us. And in the closing paragraphs of Jude, um, he's going to give us four instructions how to follow, I mean, four instructions to follow so that we can stand firm and fight for the faith. If I could get verses 17 through 19. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. how they told you that there would be mockers in the last times who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the spirit. Uh, so the first point um, that I want you to take down today is to remember God's word so there are no surprises. Um, from the very beginning of time, we see that Satan has always attacked the Word of God. It was, it's one of his most deadly traps. Uh, once we begin to question God's Word, we open ourselves up for the attacks of Satan. You remember, uh, this is how Eve fell into disobedience in the garden. Um, look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, 
Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Uh, we alone are not strong enough to fight against the devil. Um, he started to make Eve question, did God really say that in his word? Uh, and we need the truth of the word to protect us. Uh, he tells them in this passage, Jude tells them to remember the prediction of the apostles. Remembering here in the text um, is not intended to be like this mental exercise, but rather something like looking back, looking back to what the apostles had already said so that they could draw power and strength to face battles in the present. Um, and Jude was most likely pointing back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and let's just take a look to see what it says. But now, this that is in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal despisers of God. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. See, there are two principles here worth drawing our attention. One, the false intruders or false teachers claim to know God more than anyone else yet they live according to their own desires. And sadly, many of us do the same today. Um, Jude is telling us and reminding us that if we claim to know Christ without following Christ, this is nothing but demonic nonsense. I'm gonna say that again. If we claim to know Christ, but we don't follow Christ, then it's nothing more than demonic nonsense. See, those who truly know Christ, they give evidence of it. Somebody say evidence. Uh, so do not be hoodwink, SMZ, and do not be deceived by teachers and their talk. You need to watch how they live, and that will let you know where they stand. Uh, we have to be careful because this idea of hyper grace has taken over in church. I mean, it's, it's crept in the church. You see it everywhere, this idea that I can do whatever I want to do, say whatever I want to say, live however I want to live, and tell God I'm sorry, and because I'm saved, he forgives me, and all is well. Um, and a lot of times how it creeps into church is through ticklers. Yes, because they, they tickle your fancy and tell you the things that you want to hear, and that's why we bought into this hyper grace. You can't live like you want to live and claim to be a Christian. You can't do like you want to do and expect that God's grace and favor is going to be on your life. It's not about how much you go to church. It's about how much you follow the things that are taught to you when you are here in church. All right, so when we look at these ticklers, who are they? They are the pastors and the preachers, and the, they are the pastors. We got some, not you, not so at Second Mount Zion. But they are the teachers, they are the preachers, they are the pastors that tell you what you want to hear. <laughs> now, I want to say, if you never get uncomfortable, if you never feel challenged or convicted, when the word is going forth, that that's a problem. If every time you go to church or every time you turn on your favorite, you know, pastor on social media, social media, and you feel so happy inside and it tickles your fancy, something's wrong with that. And most likely you are listening to a false teacher. Uh, because when I look at the word, when I look at the word, the Bible says that God's word pierces even to the soul and spirit. God's word cuts, and I said cuts, 
It cuts us directly to the deepest core of our being and brings about conviction. So if this isn't happening, I don't care how emotional you get, how many tears you shed, uh, how high you jumped in church, how loud you shouted, uh, you're just having a sensual moment without any spiritual transformation. You shouldn't be so comfortable every Sunday sitting in the pews when the word is going forth. If the true word is being preached, you're gonna be cut, you're gonna be uncomfortable, and you are gonna be convicted. You wanna sit under teachers and preachers that challenge you to change your life. And I'm afraid that the greatest tragedy today in ministry is that some of God's people, we don't know how to discern the difference between soul ministry and the ministry of the spirit. Because there's so much religious showmanship that saints are being deceived and confused. And they're not able to discern the real from the fake. Um, And the only way to do that is God's word. So it takes the spirit to minister to us, to make us more like him. Uh, So I I would say to you that if we're going to contend for the faith, if we're going to fight from the faith and not get knocked out in the 10th round, like Mark Tyson did um, in that fight, we are going to have to be willing to start lifting some bigger spiritual weights. Um, instead of being entertained and coddled by these watered-down cotton candy messages that makes us feel good. Oh, they're good for now, but they do nothing. I said they do nothing for you when you are in the fight of your life and trouble comes. All right, now we're going to move to uh, verses 20 through 21 because that's going to bring us to the second instruction that Jude gives us. He said, you, but you, beloved, building, somebody say building, Building. yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ until eternal life. Uh, You have to build your Christian life. That means that there can be no complacency. Um, And I want to put an emphasis on the word build because the word build is a verb. That means it's an action word. That means there's some action steps that need to be taken. See, just as a bodybuilder, they develop their body through diet and exercise. We have to build our Christian life through staying in the word of God and a solid, solid, prayer life. Uh, The Christian life must never, ever stand still. Uh, If it does, just like my body did, you know, when I was talking about the pictures that I was looking at, it will go backwards. Um, So just as the apostates, and that was people um, in this passage that had abandoned the word of God, they were false teachers, they are in the, the business of tearing down we must be in the building, the business of building each other up and building ourselves up in the faith. So first we got to focus on our own spiritual life and then on the local assembly of believers. See, the foundation of our Christian life is our most holy faith. But the strength of your faith depends on our discipline to study, practice, and obey God's word. See, the word of God is vital to our spiritual growth. I have yet to meet a strong, fruitful Christian who ignores the word of God. It just is impossible. You can't tell me that I'm a strong Christian and that my walk with God is solid, solid, and all you do is come to church once a week. And I don't know, some of us be like, I came to church every month. I mean, every month out of the year, I was there every single Sunday. But if you're coming to church, really think about it. And you're trying to condition yourself, and all you do is come to church once a week. You come here for the little hour and a half, for the little two hours. And then the rest of the week, you don't think about God. You don't pray. You don't open your Bible. Baby, you are not going to be able to contend for the faith. 
So you, you wonder why you can't contend when things get hard, why you feel like you're losing your mind, why you feel like depression is taking over, why you quickly run to sinful pleasures to help you cope with life. It's because you are out of shape. True contenders train daily. Somebody say daily. So what does that look like? We should be spending devotional time in the Word every day, seeking the mind of God. I used to think that my dad was crazy. I mean, he was annoying to me. I mean, every single time I'm trying to come to him, like, I remember I told him, I just need you to be my dad. I don't need you to be my pastor. Because I was trying to come to him with my emotional problems, and every time I came to him, he just wanted to keep quoting the Bible. And I was getting frustrated with him. And my dad, like he does, if you don't want to listen, he'll go silent on you. He said, well, I hope you figure it out. You know, you know best. You know what I told you. And he left it at that. And I mean, I'm running around here calling every time Dick and Harry. I'm calling all my girlfriends. Um, I'm meditating. I'm looking at the horoscopes. Um, I'm doing all of this stuff, and I'm still coming up empty only to find that the answers had been in the Word the whole time. It was a reason why he kept quoting those scriptures to me. It was a reason why he kept saying, go back to the Bible. Now, as I got older and I matured, I realized that the Bible has answers for every single problem. It has answers for your finances, for your relationship, for parenting, for friendships, depression, um, mental illness, anything that you can think of, the answer is in the Bible. So not only, not only do we need to be studying God's Word, we need to make sure we have that prayer life. Because they go hand in hand, and that is the one-two knockout combo if you get in the ring with Satan. See, prayer is where the power to build comes from. See, the Word is the light, and prayer is the power. So if all you do is read and study the Word, see, you need both, because if all you do is read and study the Word, then you have light. You know the truth, but you don't actually have any power. And that is why you need that spiritual combo for growth. Uh, we have to pray. Let's talk about prayer. Because some of us have a misconception about praying. And we wonder why our prayers are not being answered. And my question is, how do you pray? Um, you have to pray in step with the Spirit. Uh, not a whole bunch of whining and crying and rambling and begging God for stuff. And I know that sounds harsh, but God ain't, he don't care about your whining. He's not interested in your begging and your whining. And even if that sounds harsh, I got to tell you, it's the truth. So how should we be praying? Uh... You need to pray with your Bible open. What I mean by that is you need to pray God's Word back to Him. This will ensure that our prayers are guided by and promoted by the Spirit. Prayer is like the water in a faucet. Uh, we don't create the water um, that are in the pipes, but we can choose to turn the faucet on. When we pray, we are choosing to turn the faucet on. Then Jude in verse 21 that I read, it said Jude gives us an added factor for building. Uh, so he said that we had the word of God, then we're going to, the spirit of God and prayer. Then he says abide, somebody say abide. abide. Abide in God's love. And he's not talking about a fuzzy feeling or being sentimental when he says love. Uh, but he's talking about obedience. We need to understand when you're a Christian that love means obedience. How do I know this? Let's take a look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. Yeah, one eye, John. <laughs> but, so, but whosoever keep his word, truly the love of God is perfection in him. By this we know that we are in him. Uh, and if that wasn't enough for you, Let's look at John with no eyes, just regular John, chapter 15, verse 10. It says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. 
So the love, to love God is to love what he loves and to hate what he hates. So essentially to abide in God's love means that you do what he says. Um, now, I know that we all mess up. Nobody is above that. But what I'm talking about is you're not making a lifestyle out of willfully and purposefully sinning, meaning that it's not habitual for you. Uh, even as an adult, I, I know I keep going back to my dad, but when I, I think about what he said last week in his sermon, uh, when I was doing wrong, he said when his kids was doing wrong, we purposely, I know I didn't want to see my dad. If I knew I was doing wrong, sometimes it would be four, five, six weeks at a time, and I didn't want to go around him because I knew I wasn't doing the right thing. Yeah. Um, it was affecting our relationship. And it's, it's the same way with God, with our Father. When we are in sin, when you are habitually sinning, you know you live in wild, you know you live in ratchet, you know you live in crazy. How many times do you be like, I don't feel like going to church? I don't feel like being bothered. Sin is what separates us from God. Um, and oftentimes, believers, we get to a point when we keep habitually sinning and doing the same thing. That's why you lose your joy. That's why when you come in the sanctuary, you say you can't feel nothing and you're not feeling it anymore. It's because you've allowed sin to get in the way of your relationship with God. Um, holy living does not happen by accident, and it does not happen because you are a Christian. Uh, you got to do the work. Somebody say work. You have to contend for the faith. Somebody say contend. Uh, do you agonize for the faith? Because this is the only way to abide in God's love. Now we're going to come to the third instruction that Jude has given us. Um, and that's going to come from verses 22 and 23. And some have compassion, making a distinction. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, having even the garment defiled by the flesh. Uh, the next thing that we have to do to contend for the faith is exercise spiritual discernment. Um, and that means that we proceed with caution, but we should not be abandoning the flock. Jude tells us to have mercy on those who are in doubt. Um, yes, we are to watch out for false teachers who have crept into the church or distorting the, teachers of the teachings of Jesus. But this does not mean that we have no regard for people and where they are with their walk with God. I mean, think about it this way. Any serious weightlifter or bodybuilder knows that being a spotter um, is bound to happen sometime during their workouts. I mean, whether you're spotting a workout partner that you came to the gym with or somebody in the gym just asked you to help them out, you're going to need to be ready, say ready, ready, ready to assist. Uh, spotting is crucial um, for keeping other athletes safe and helping them get the most out of their workouts. So Jude is telling us, he's telling the bodies of believers that we need to be spiritual spotters who use discernment when assisting those who need help. And, and he talks about three different type of people that may need help. And, and the first type that he's talking about is those who are doubting. They are the people who are wavering, they are converted, but they're not stable, they're not grounded in their faith. And it is our responsibilities to disciple these people. Um, and this is going to require a great deal of love and patience. And every member should be discipled. Pastor Moore cannot disciple every single person. Uh, in church, we have to get back to discipleship. It's not just for a cohort of upcoming deacons. It's not just for a select few of women, but every single Christian should be discipled by a more mature Christian. Because you need somebody to teach you how to do life. 
Uh, the, the problems aren't when we in, we're in here. The problems are when Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday and I go back into the world and I got to figure out this thing called life and you tell me I have to do it in a Christian manner. I'm going to need somebody who's been doing it, who's been walking, who's been working out their faith to show me. Bring back discipleship. Um, when you think about it, uh, like I said, it requires a great deal of love and patience because immature believers are like little children. Um, and one way to draw them in from false teachings is to magnify all that they have in Christ and share the love of God in a practical way. But you want to make sure it's not infiltrated with a whole bunch of your beliefs. Uh, you want to make sure you're using the Bible as a basis for every lesson that's taught. Uh, these people are vulnerable. And that's why we need to make sure we pay close attention to our babes in the faith. Um, just a little sidebar, a little side note, it is also important that we not only pay attention to those who are young in the faith, but we also, I know they're a little bit annoying sometimes, we need to pay attention to disgruntled Christians. Um, because false teachers, they prey on the ones that are young in the faith, and they also prey on disgruntled Christians. Um, so even though they may get on our nerves, even though pastor may get a little frustrated with sometimes, or leaders may get a little frustrated with them times, we need to make sure that they are continuing to be disciple, so they know how to stand and walk out their faith. The next group is the burning group. These are those who have left the fellowship and abandoned the faith. Um, and they need to be, as it says in the text, they need to be snatched out of the fire. Um, in the 19th chapter of Genesis, uh, the angels took Lot by the hand and pulled him out of Sodom. This means that sometimes mercy, it has to be confrontational. Um, and that means that we got to be bold with this group. With this group, you can't sugarcoat it. And I know you're just struggling, baby, and I know, I know you're still praying about it. No, no, no. We got to tell them, you don't need to pray about nothing. You know what the Word says. You know what God called you to do. I love you, but you're living in disobedience, and I'm here to help you because I want to snatch you out of that fire. Um, like I said, this means, times, this means that sometimes that mercy has to be confrontational. Uh, because they have gone past doubt, and they have committed themselves to a false system. So I said this love has to be straightforward and honest, and feelings may get hurt, but I'd rather your feelings get hurt, but your soul be saved. So when you see those perverting the Word of God and deconstructing the gospel, we can't just ignore it. There is a time for comfort, but there is also a time for rebuke. I I'm reminded Raffi, he used to love to run off in parking lots when he was younger. And I told him, I said, you know, when you get to the parking lot, I said, I know it looks closed in. I said, but it's just like a street. It's cars there. Raffi, I need for you, you to stay right beside me. And I'll never forget one day we was in Cherry Hill Mall we was in the parking lot. He had a little ball in his hand and he was bouncing the ball and the ball began to roll. And he snatched away from my hand and he took off and he began running into the parking lot. I ain't say, baby, Raffi, come on, baby, come back. I went over to him and I snatched him. And I said, boy, don't you ever do that again in the parking lot. I said, there's cars here and you could be hit and killed. Don't you ever, while my hand was gripped on him, don't you ever walk away from me again in the parking lot. His eyes got big and he was a little teary because my, my voice got strong with him and he felt that, that strong grip on his, his arm, but he never forgot it. It got to the point where we would go to the mall and as soon as he get out the car, he'd be beside me, mommy, mommy me and that's what we have to do when we see people that are past doubt they're not wavering they're just in the fire they have to be snatched so we can't be so worried about being sensitive because it is a life or death situation and then we have the last group we have the dangerous group um, and with this group you must proceed with caution and I'm going to say right now everybody ain't fit enough to rescue this group 
um, when you are an unstable believer, by no means should you be dealing with this group uh, because you have to be careful with them uh, because Satan can use to them to even defile us. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Jews had to be very careful um, to avoid ceremonial defilement. See, if a clean person touched an unclean garment, then him, his, he himself would become defiled. The Jewish priests, um, if they thought a garment was infected with leprosy, they had that garment burnt. They didn't try to wash it off. They didn't try to wipe it off. It was burnt. Um, because defilement spreads rapidly. And that's why every Christian is not equipped to deal with false teachers. Uh, it takes a faithful walk and spiritual maturity to understand the devices of false teachers. And our concern still needs to be with this group because they are not beyond redemption. However, even though they have our concern, they should also have our distance. I say that again, they should also have our distance because sin is no small matter. So using discernment, we should proceed with caution. If your spiritual walk with God is not in a position to do so, then you let a more mature person handle false teachers. Least you be defiled yourself. We're going to move to the last verses 24 and 25 to get the fourth instruction from Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before his presence of his glory with exceeding joy, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Uh, so now we come to the benediction, and Jude has told us about remembering. He's told us about building, um, and now he's going to speak of rejoicing. As we commit ourselves to Jesus, we can rejoice. Why? Because God is able to keep us from falling. After you remember and after you build, we can wait on the mercy of God. What a great hope we had as Jude proclaims it. God is able to present you faultless. I want you to think about that. With all of your failures, with all of the things that you have done, none of that is too much for God to be able to keep you from permanently falling. Oh, I know you might make mistakes, but he's already given us the victory and we won't have to permanently fall. God has the power to do this, and that is the motivation for the fight for our faith. We have assurance that God is guarding us. I don't know when it will be. I don't know what day is going to be. I don't know exactly when he's coming back. But when he does, he won't ask how many times you came to church. He's not going to ask you how many ministries you headed up. He's not going to ask you how many times you shouted and cried in church. But he will ask you, did you contend for the faith? Did you hold on to the faith that once was delivered to the saints? Um, I can imagine Jesus Christ leaning over his heavenly balcony, saying, I'm counting on you, members of SMZ, to hold up the name. I'm counting on you. Deacon Leroy, I'm counting on you, Simpson. I'm counting on you, Brother Aaron. I'm counting on you, Pandora. I'm counting on you to live a holy life. I'm counting on you to let your light shine. I'm counting on you to show the world you are mine. I'm counting on you to fight for the faith. That's our Sunday school lesson for today.
ready? Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Today in Sunday school, we read script, the scripture we read was Jude 17, 25, about how he wrote to the church to build them, um, to build themselves up and not be pulled away from God. And we had, we had different subjects that could pull us away from God and that could build us up and bring us back to the church. Here we have child friendly, well, less child friendly services, boring service, drugs and social media, bad friends, bad energy, and bad influence that could pull us away from the church, and how we could build ourselves up by reading the Bible for guidance, surrounding ourselves with people with godly influence, good energy, and ask questions to our fellow Christian um, pastor, like Pastor Moore, deacons, and people that come to the church regularly. Amen. Amen.
As we stand and prepare our hearts to come to the Lord in prayer. If you wish, you may approach the altar right now. As we know, there is no God like Jehovah. As we celebrate National Women's Heritage Month, there's no God like Jehovah because we thank him for placing some women in our lives some matriarchs, some grandmamas, some aunties, some mothers of the church, some mothers that when we couldn't even call on the name Jehovah, they humbled themselves and prayed on our behalf. For even the Bible tells us in Galatians 4.4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son to be born of a woman. As our very own Minister Pandora Curtis comes and goes to the Lord on our behalf. Ooh. 
Thank you, Jesus. No Cameron, there's no God like Jehovah. Oh, taste and see how great he is. Ooh, we will lift up our eyes to the hills from which comes our help, God. We just thank you. We glorify you. We honor you. We praise you, God, for this day, God. We praise you, God, for knowing us better than we know ourselves, God. We know that when our help comes, God, and there is no God like the God of healing, our comfort comes, our peace comes, our help comes in the form of a portion of our love, of grace and mercy. Our help comes, God, in the way we treat one another, God. And in the name of Jesus today, God, we ask that you will cover, God, cover every household that is represented here today, God. Cover every every situation that is represented here today, God, because we know you are a healing God. We ask you to cover addiction, God. We ask you to cover doubt, God. We ask you to cover lack of faith, God. We ask you, God, in the name of Jesus to bring about a new beginning, God. Make everything new in our lives, God. Give us a reason to get up in the morning, God. Give us a reason to praise you, God, knowing that you and you alone will make all things new, God. Knowing that with through you all things are possible, God. Knowing that nothing can separate us from your love, God. Not height, nor depth, not width, God, nothing can separate us from your love, God. Nothing we can do will bring us out of your grace and glory, God, because you loved us so much, God. We worship you today, God. We trust in you today, God. And we ask God right now that you would lift up this woman preacher, this woman that's going to preach the word, God, this woman history month, trailblazing woman, God. We ask right now, God, that you would lift Lift her up, God, that from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet, God, let there be a word for a time as this, God. And we thank you for Reverend James Moore Sr., God, that he does not see it as robbery to have preachers come onto his pulpit and spread the gospel, God, spread the love, spread the good news, God. Tell a dying world that you got to change, that there is joy. There is restoration. There is hope. There is peace. There is calmness, God. There is forgiveness and togetherness, God. And right now, God, in this moment, God, open up our hearts and minds to receive what you have in store, God. Not just from a woman, but from a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, God. We just love you, God. And we just praise you, God, for the anointing in this place, God. That each one of us will walk in here with God and leave with. Let us be strong in the Lord in all that he is in our lives. So that when we walk out into the world tomorrow, they will see your glory, God. Let our light so shine among men that they may see our good works, how we handle every situation. And you get the glory, God. In Jesus' name, amen.
this beautiful youth mass choir celebrate our musicians. Amen. Our minister of music, Aaron, is doing a phenomenal job. Amen. Along with Sister Faith and the Owens, the dedication, amen, is certainly, certainly evident. We thank God for a church that is clearly not dying. Amen. Amen. I do greet you in that name that is above every name, and that is the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. I am going to take just five seconds, since Pastor has allowed me to, to have the mic, to ask that you would join me in celebrating, and I'll tell you why, the man of God of this house. As I mature, today is the sixth year that I've been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of you may remember, it, the church looked a little differently, amen, but the first Sunday in March 2018, and God has been just blowing my mind and allowing me to fellowship with so many other churches, and when I say that everywhere that I go, whether it's in Philadelphia or Jersey, that people know our pastor, that it is an honor, it is an honor to be a daughter of Second Mount Zion. I am proud to say, humbled, that this man is the only pastor that I have ever known. So help me celebrate our pastor. Stand to your feet. Help me celebrate the shepherd of this house, the man of God, our Mordecai, he who pours into us Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, 37 plus years. Amen. We thank God for the gift of God that our pastor is to the body of Christ locally, uh, uh, statewide, and nationally. And I honor my sister, Kanisha, and her brothers for sharing him with us. Amen. Amen. I do also recognize my fellow preacher proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Minister Haskins, Minister Mom. Amen. Minister, Minister St Reverend Stafford is on assignment, but I thank him and I thank Reverend Brown also. Amen. I honor all of my family, my granna, my boo thing. Y'all know I love my granna. Amen. My sister, my twin stuff, my godmothers, amen. Godmother Val, amen. Godmother Sissy, amen. I know she's recovering, amen. Also, my little sister, Jay Lynn, she is in a production today, so y'all keep her in prayer. I think her schedule is just about as crazy as me and stuff's, amen. To our deacons, trustees, leadership, everybody, our Facebook fam and friends, I know that there are some that are watching online, too my PECPA colleague, amen, Tiffany and her friends, thank you for being here, amen, and to all of our guests, amen, and to Lottie Dottie and everybody as they say, that way everyone is included. I do, there is a word from the Lord, if you, and I thank Baby Girl for reading that for us earlier, both did a beautiful job, um, Baby Girl and Gabe and prayer, just beautiful, Miss Audrey, amen. <laughs> The book of Esther, turn with me as we celebrate and kick off Women's History Month. Amen. Chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. I'll be reading from the New International Version, and you will find words similar to these. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast from me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king. 
even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Amen. And the word of God is blessed for the people of God. For just a few moments, I believe that the Lord would have me to encourage us all, but really specifically focusing on the women of God, the young and older women of God underneath my, the sound of my voice, encouraging you all to act like a queen, think like the king. Act like a queen, think like the king. Father God, right now in the name of Jesus, hide me behind thy cross. Please, God, move Tiffany out of the way so that the presence of your spirit can come forth and deliver this word, not for my fame, fortune, or reputation, but solely, God, that your daughters would know to act like queens and think like the king. In the name of Jesus, please let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, for you are my Lord, my strength, my redeemer, and I love you, Father. We love you on today. Have your way in Jesus' name. Now, I know I'm probably about to date myself, but just by a show of hands, how many people remember Steve Harvey's 2009 women's self-help book, Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man? Y'all, I know y'all remember it. Amen. Now, I don't know about many of you, but as for me, there were several reasons why 23-year-old Tiffany, Tiffany, did not, could not, would not read the book written by TV radio host, actor, comedian, former boxer, all auto worker, insurance salesman, carpet cleaner, and mailman, which purported to instruct women on what we needed to do and think in order to get and keep a man. Now, I'm going to keep it real, though, unless y'all look at me funny. I'm a millennial. I watched the 2012 uh, movie quite a few times. It was a, it was a good movie. So I get it. You know, the, the title alone, Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man, it certainly grabs your attention, but... The title's underlying concept, what it implies, is not really new. At least it should not be to those of us that are Christians, that are disciples, that are followers of Christ. Uh, uh, stay with me. Act like, be, exist, live like what you are, what you were created to be, yet think like, reason like, consider from the vantage point that you were not born with, a vantage point that does not come naturally, a vantage point that you cannot get on your own because it must be freely given, freely revealed, made known to you by the one who possesses it. People of God, I wonder, I wonder, what if uh, Christians, children of God most high, were running, my sister Kanisha, to the word of God, seeking to be spiritually transformed through practical application, seeking to think like the king, to embody the very mind of Christ, just like the women ran to the bookstore and every place that sold the book in the movie. What if we were trying to think like the king, ultimate king, who created men? When I read God's word, I hear the father instructing his daughters to act like a queen and think like the king. Oh, somebody say, act like a queen. Think like the king. The book of Esther, the book of Esther is one of the Old Testament historical books. It's a narrative, a story set within the Jewish diaspora, the scattering of the Jews during Persian rule. After Ezra and Nehemiah tell the story of the remnant who returned to Jerusalem, we find the book of Esther presumably through the eyes of Mordecai, Esther's cousin and adoptive father, telling the story of the remnant of Israel who decided not to leave but to remain in Persia. Now some school scholars, they question whether the story Esther tells actually happened. Esther is often referred to as the biblical book that does not mention the name of God, when yet it is undeniable that the book of Esther evidences the divine providence of the supernatural move of God, Jehovah Shammah, the Lord God who is present, the Lord God who is in fact there. 
In the chapters which immediate, which precede our text, chapters one through three, we learn that the king of Persia, his name was King Xerxes, that he was a fairly young king, a newer king, that he dethroned his then current wife, Queen Vashti, because she said no, because she refused his drunken request to appear before him, his officials, all the people in her crown. Then after that, many virgins, including Esther, were gathered together, taken into custody by the king. They were required to compete in Mrs. Pe uh, Persia pageant, and Esther was favored, says the word of God. She was chosen to be queen, but no one knew that Esther was a Jew because Mordecai advised her not to share that part of herself with them. And then we see that there is a man named Haman who got a taste of power. Haman was elevated in the Persian government. People were supposed to bow down to him, but Mordecai refused to bow down. Yeah, yeah. And then Haman wanted to kill and annihilate all of the Jews. Yeah. When we get to the fourth chapter of Esther, before our text, we see Mordecai finding about, out about a law that the king issued at Haman's request years later, which did in fact allow for the destruction, the annihilation of all of the Jews under Persian rule. Now this was approximately 20% of the Persian population. Just to make it live, black people, we make up about 13.6% of the US population, according to the census. So we find Mordecai understandably devastated, grief-stricken, engaging in the mourning practices of the time, tearing his clothes, putting on a material called sackcloth. It was a rough cloth made from goat's hair, putting on ashes, and going to the king's gate to lament, to full-on ugly cry. Soon after, Jews all over Persia joined him. They were mourning, weeping, wailing, crying, terrified, plain old shook. But Queen Esther, she was living the good life living good, lavishly in the palace. She was clueless, had no idea what was going on. Eventually, though, she hears about Mordecai being posted up at the king's gate, crying, completely carrying on. So Esther sends her attendant to the gate to give Mordecai some clothes. He done ripped up all the clothes that he had, and she tries to find out what's going on because Mordecai did not accept the clothes. Mordecai tells the attendant, who tells Esther everything. Haman was mad that Mordecai did not bow down to him. So Haman lied, told the king that all the Jews were disobeying the king, so the king issued the law authorizing the total destruction of the Jews in Persia. After Mordecai catches Esther up to speed, he asked her to go to the king, go to your husband and beg for, plead for the lives of your people, the people that he don't know you're a part of though. But Esther was reasonably apprehensive because there was a law in Persia that forbade anyone, including the queen, from going into the king's presence without an invitation. And Esther had not been invited into the king's presence in over 30 days. That's a long time. When we find our text, verses 12 to 17, we see the conclusion of the conversation between Esther and Mordecai through the attendant, and it is here where I believe the Lord reveals three takeaways for us, people of God, women and God in particular, as we celebrate Women's History Month. I'll share them with you quickly, and then I'll take my seat. First is the truth that no queen is exempt. Oh, somebody to say, no queen is exempt. Verses 12 and 13. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Don't think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. People of God, Mordecai tells Esther, girl, don't get it twisted. You may not be out here in these streets with us. Just because, though, the people who are trying to kill us don't know that you are one of us doesn't mean that they won't come for you when they find out. Come on now. 
Mordecai tries to convince Esther to realize that where she lives, my God, who she's married to, her title, her elevated position does not change who she is. Can't you hear Mordecai, Esther? You may be the queen of Persia. You may be accepted by the elite, those who are in fact trying to impress us, but you are still a Jew. You will never not be one of us. People of God, now maybe not so at Second Mount Zion Baptist Church, but I'm sure that you all know some people, I know that I know some people, that once they get elevated, my God, once they get a little bit of success, once they get some marketplace or some ministry accolades, once they get invited to the table, they sit down and they take a seat, they get real comfortable and they forget how they got there my god why because they believe that they have arrived they they forget uh, uh, the sacrifices of their parents that got them there thank you mom thank you granna they forget the village that believed in them when no one else did thank you second mount zion they forget the church that prayed for them covered them helped them when no one else could they forget the pain Pastor, my God, Jesus, and the leaders who showed up for them when no one else would. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Esther's separation from her people polluted her mindset. Even if just for one moment, she thought that she would be exempt from the plight and trouble of her people. But Mordecai reminds her, no queen is exempt. Women of God, women of God, let us never forget that yes, each and every one of us are queens, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what our status, our position, our title is. It doesn't matter how many letters we have after or before our names. None of that changes who we are. None of it changes where we came from. None of it changes who paved the way for us. We can never forget, never forget that no queen Queen is exempt. We all used to be something. Women of God before Shirley Chisholm was the first black woman elected to Congress. She endured gender and race discrimination. Before the Madam C.J. Walker was the first black woman, a self-made millionaire in America. She was the daughter of former slaves. Before Catherine Jones was the first black woman to work at NASA as a scientist. She was a computer that wore a skirt. Before the Honorable Constance Baker Mockley was the first black woman to argue before the Supreme Court of the United States and the first black woman to serve as a federal judge. She was just a little girl that spoke up and spoke out. Let me bring this close to home. Come here, Dr. Stephanie. Before my sister, my God, my twin, my God, my BFF, my God, was on track to complete her doctor of nurse practice, my God, she was just a devastated young black girl that did not get into medical school, my God, but she became determined. She became destined, my God, and she surrendered, my God, to the plan of God. I tell you when the word of God says, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper and not to harm you, plans of hope and a future. Oh, the word of God is real. My God, never forget. Never forget that every queen has her own story before it becomes his story. Now, not only, not only is no queen exempt, but I see something else in the text. Oh, somebody say, this is the queen's time. Verse 14. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place but you. And your family's, your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. 
Here Mordecai is still addressing Esther's apprehension to go before the king. Says, niece, daughter, if you don't unite your people, our people, God's people now, best believe God will find another way to deliver us. But you and your family name will cease to exist. Then he asked her that profound question that many of us may be familiar with. What if you were anointed and appointed queen for such a time as this? Whew. He says, what if this is the queen's time and you miss it? What if this is your time and you let it pass you by? How many times, how many times, people of God, have we allowed apprehension, insecurities, naysayers, others, our fears, what it looks like around us to keep us silent, to preclude and stop us from acting as if we knew that it was our time? And what if we missed it. What if there were more Mordecai's, hey, hallelujah God, to remind Esther's that it's not just about you, that you did not get there on your own, but just like God allowed a Jewish orphan to become queen in a foreign land for a reason. Oh, God allowed the son or daughter of a single welfare mother, the product of the Philadelphia school district, a little country girl, a little country boy, and X blank blank, he allowed you to become a delivered, set free, chosen, handpicked, held, released, loose, forgiven child of God for a reason. Why? Because there are people that need your voice. There are people that I can't reach. Each and every woman and girl underneath the sound of my voice stands on the shoulders of women, mothers, aunties, big sisters, grandmothers, godmothers, other mothers, strangers alike, who have laid Mom Jackie the foundation, loosened Minister Haskins the ground, and fought and endured inequality, discrimination, sexism, Miss Angie, on the job in schools, in the church, in their homes, on the street, from the White House to Capitol Hill, and in court, in order to pierce the proverbial glass ceiling for us. And. They didn't do it alone. They couldn't have. But there were Mordecai's, thank you, Jesus, men of God who had Issachar mindsets, men of God who knew the time, men who were divinely positioned in their lives, who were willing and able to assist them, even when it was unpopular, even when it challenged their own understanding. Queen, queen, queen. This is your time. This is our time. As a matter of fact, we're literally bearing witness to what can only be described as the intentional work, the intentional move of God in the earth, particularly through his beautiful black daughters. In our lifetimes, we've witnessed Michelle Obama become the first black first lady of the United States. Kamala Harris become the first black a an Asian American woman vice president of the United States. Jessica Tanji Brown Harris become the first black woman justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Speak Joanna McClinton, become the first black woman speaker of the PA House. The Honorable Sherelle Parker, become the first black woman mayor of the city of Philadelphia. The Reverend Dr. Marcia Brown Woodard, become the first woman president of the Baptist Pastors and Ministers Conference of Philadelphia and Vicinity. Oh, somebody say, this yeah. is the Queen's time. Now, finally, finally, at least I hold you too long. In order to act like a queen and think like a king, not only must we recognize that no king, no queen is exempt, and not only must we accept that this is the queen's time, but finally, we must be willing to risk it all. Woo, Jesus. Woo, hallelujah. 
Our text this morning concludes in verses 15 and 17 with Esther's final reply to Mordecai in this discourse where she indeed acts like a queen and thinks like the king. Oh, she turns from her own short-sighted self-agenda to God's eternal purpose, my God. She's willing to die for her people. We literally see Esther shift just in this one conversation with her father figure. Men of God, men of God, never doubt the impact of one conversation. We see her shift. She shifts from apprehension to appreciation, inaction to action, fear to faith, isolation to initiation, silence to sacrifice, being concealed to being revealed, self-interest to God's interest. And she was willing to risk it all, my God. She went before the king, appointed and anointed, set apart and supported, guarded and guarded, prepared and proactive, and she fulfilled her assignment, and she received a new level, my God, of authority. There are many of us, many of us, that are wondering why God has not taken us to the next. We're wondering why we have not seen the new. Why? Because you have not done what God has instructed you to do where you are right now. Oh, help me, Jesus. People of God, what, what, what are you willing, hallelujah, to let die in order to fulfill your God-given assignment in the earth? Is there anybody here that would join me and say, Father God, whatever is in me that is not like you, take it away in the name of Jesus. Whatever precludes me from being who you knew me to be before I was even formed in my mother's womb, take it away, God, in the name of Jesus. Whatever precludes and stops me from being who you created me to be, whoever stops me from being who you created me to be, take them away, God, in the name of Jesus. Take it away. Every old thing that precludes your new thing, take it away, God. Every lot that hinders me from hearing your voice, take them away, God. Every grudge, every fear, all resentment, all unforgiveness, take it away. God, in the name of Jesus, every wayward way, every religious ritual, every pitiful place, every perpetrating person, every fake friend, every betraying brother, every sabotaging sister, every empty environment, every sad situation, take them away, take them away in the name of Jesus. Do it for your glory. As I close, as I close, as I close, least, 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 Lease, lease, lease. I knock and invite it back. Let me uh, uh, mention, my God, another person, hallelujah, who was not only willing to, but who did in fact die. And not only just for one group of people, my God, but for all people. You know who I'm talking about. To my grandma, he's a will in the middle of the will. To my mama, he's a willy, won't he do it? To Pastor, he's the one who stepped on Abraham's generation, that stepped on Isaac's generation, that stepped on Jacob's generation. But when I look back over my life, my God, for me, and I'm grateful for who he is to them, but for me, he is the reason I can act like a queen and think like the king. My God, he is the reason I will not be conformed to this world, but I will be transformed by the renewing of my mind, and I'll present my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you, God. He's the reason I don't mind if you think it's a show because I will let this mind be the mind that is in Christ Jesus so that when I want to clap back my God this mind reminds me to be kind to others forgiving them as Christ has forgiven me when I want to give into the flesh this mind reminds me that the desires of the flesh are against the spirit when I want to match energy this mind reminds me to love my enemies, bless those who curse me, do good to those who hate on me, and pray for those who spitefully use me. When I find myself, because I do, in spaces and places where I'm not sure if I belong, this mind reminds me that I belong to God, and I am a 
winner because he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Oh, he came over 2,000 years ago when God reached in himself, took out himself, placed and wrapped himself in flesh, allowed himself to walk on the earth for 30 long years. Then after by and by, by no fault of his own, he allowed me, oh men, to take him and hang him up on Calvary's rugged cross. They hung my Savior high. They stretched him wide. And there for your sins and owls, he hung, bled, and died. But that's not where the story ends. They took him down off that cross. They placed him in a borrowed tomb. And he got out three days later with all power in his hands. That's why he didn't even, he, he didn't leave us alone though. He, he gave us a promise. He said that he would never leave us. He said that we would have a comforter. And he fulfilled his promise. He sent us his spirit who now resides on the inside of us. So people of God, we have the same resurrection power that rose Christ from the dead on the inside of us. That and that alone is why we can act like queens, women of God, and think like the king. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 We can stand to our feet. Hallelujah. At this time, the thing that I love about the King of Kings that's different from King Xerxes, one of many, is that we have an open invitation to come into his presence. And it's not just hallelujah, praise God, praise God. He invites us, hallelujah, to become a part of a bigger family. He invites us to become children of God. Yeah. He invites us to allow him to be a big brother that would never leave us nor forsake us. Yeah. So this is your time. If you have been orphaned and you haven't had a spiritual family, Second Mount Zion is a good place to join the yeah. family, yeah. to allow us to journey with you as my sister taught in church school, as we journey together and learning how to act like queens and think like the king, learning how to live this Christian journey, why don't you come now? While, come while there's time. God has placed something special on the inside of you to do in the earth, and we're here to help you cultivate that. Join our family, join Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Let us journey with you. seated. Amen. like a queen. And if you're a king, act like a king. But think like the king. Amen. I can hear Tamala, Tamala, man, take me to the king. Amen. Amen. They got the mic on now because I don't know that song. But the 
But when I knew that one earlier today, they had my mic off. <laughs> Amen, amen, amen. Two things we want to do very quickly before we uh, receive uh, the offering. Uh, we, we want to uh, celebrate all of the March birthdays. Amen. Uh, Brother Aaron going to give me that key that I sang in. And, and we're going to ask all of the March birthdays, if you would stand. Why don't you stand if you were born in March? Amen. March is a popular month. Amen. Look at all this. Look at all these March folk. Amen. All right. All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to all of the March birthdays. Amen. Tiffany kind of, kind of mentioned it, but y'all know what today is? Today is the first Sunday in March. Y'all know what happened 38 years ago, the first Sunday in March? I preached my first sermon at Second Mount Zion. Amen. 38 years ago. And uh, they had already decided who they was going to get, but, but they just asked me to stop by and just fill the pill pit. And, and one of the deacons said, now we got two Sundays, which one you want? The first or the third? I said, give me the first in case y'all want me to come back the third. I came and preached the first Sunday and they asked me to come back the third Sunday. And you know what? The rest is history. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. And I'm still here. Amen. And, and only one difference, only one difference. My hair got shorter and whiter, but everything else is still the same. Amen, amen, amen. God bless. All right, all right, all right, all right. You know, th this is one of my favorite times of the worship service when we get ready to give. And I'm glad that we are New Testament givers because in the New Testament, it said, and God loves a cheerful giver. In the Old Testament, they was demanded to give. But in the New Testament, amen, they freely gave, and they did it with cheerfulness. In other words, and, and, and that word in the Greek, that word cheerfully in the Greek, it really translates an hilarious giver. And uh, I don't know about you, but I am a hilarious giver because I'm, I'm so God that, glad that God gave it to me. Amen. Amen, amen. All right, our trustees are going to come, and uh, I need not remind you that on the fourth Sunday in— oh, okay, I'll take that. Uh, I, I, I need not remind you that on the fourth Sunday next month in April is, will be our church's 95th anniversary. And I just thought that we ought to do something big for the 95th an an anniversary. Amen. Yeah, and you, 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 you know what Andy would tell Bonnie, Bonnie Fight when he'd tell him something? And he said, what you think about that? Oh, Andy said, the oh, only thing I can think of is just big. Yeah. Amen. Big. Amen. So, so uh, amen. You, you've already been, you know, I don't need to get up every Sunday and remind you that we ask you for $1,000. And uh, you can get started right now, and you've got to the end of the year to finish it. And uh, I don't. And, and some of y'all can do it, you know, now. And and some of you can do it by the fourth Sunday in April. And so I'm gonna say I'm gonna say this today, and I don't I don't I don't feel the need to have to get up every Sunday and talk about money, because y'all know I don't like to talk about money. But I will ask for what I need. 
and I've asked for $95,000 on our church anniversary. Amen. Y'all gonna help me get it? Amen, 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 amen. We're ready to give. Uh, amen. All right, those are persons in the balcony. Why don't you come now? Amen. his mother Things come of thee, O Lord. And of thine own have we given thee. You may remain standing and now under him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy to the only one wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power let everybody say it in peace.
and serve the Lord.